Well, that's one kind of excess too. And, and since we're all in, in workshops here, um, here's another kind of excess. It has to do with the right choice of words. Uh, I mentioned this the other day, citing Mr. Warren and Mr. Houseman and, 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 and that situation. Um, another one, a friend of mine, a friend of mine has written a poem about this, and I know some of you heard this poem before, so I, I beg your uh, pardon, but some haven't heard it. Um, and it's a poem in which one of the, what Jim Wright called a no-no word uh, is used repeatedly. And it calls your attention to the fact that words can change and do change, and that's part of our responsibility to, uh, to manage. The poem is called Decorum, and I'm sure that you all don't need to be told what decorum is, though Mr. Stephen Dunn tells you in his poem what it is. She wrote, they were making love up against the gymnasium wall, and another young woman in the class, serious enough to smile, said, no, that's fucking. They must have been fucking, to which many agreed pleased to have the proper fit of word with act. But an older woman, a wife, a mother, famous in the class for confusing grace with decorum and carriage, said the F word would distract the reader, sensationalize the poem. Why can't what they were doing just as easily be called making love? And the class proceeded to debate what's fucking, what's making love and the importance of context, tact, the bon mot. I leaned toward those who favored fucking. They were funnier and seemed to have more experience with the happy, <laughs> with the happy varieties of their subject. <laughs> but then a young man said, now believing he had permission, what's the difference? You fuck them and you call it making love. You tell them what they want to hear. The class jeered, and another man said, you're the kind of guy who gives fucking a bad name. <laughs> and I remembered how fuck gets dirty as it moves reptilian out of certain minds, certain mouths. The young woman, whose poem it was, small-boned and small-voiced, said she had no objection to fucking, but these people were making love. It was her poem and she herself up against that gymnasium wall. And it felt like love and to hell with all of us. <laughs> there was silence. The class turned to me, their teacher, who they hoped would clarify, perhaps ease things. I told them I disliked the word fucking in a poem, but that fucking might be right in this instance. Yet I was unsure now. I couldn't decide. A tear formed and moved down the poet's cheek. I said I was sure only of gymnasium. Sure it was the wrong choice, <laughs> making the act seem too public, more vulgar than she wished. How about Boathouse, I said. <laughs> I, I read this poem by Steve so many times, I feel like I owe him royalties. <laughs> I wish I had written it. Uh, this is a, a little poem. Uh, for reasons I can't, I don't know, can't say, I've become interested in writing about tools. My grandfather was a naval engineer, my father was a naval engineer, and we always had tools in the house, so, which I never wanted to use, but now I'm interested in them. This, this describes what's called a come along. Some of you will know what a come along is. Um, it's basically uh, a pulley with some ropes. You attach one of the ropes to a tree or something stable and you use the other rope and the pulley to move something that's too heavy for you to otherwise move it. Now there are, there are contemporary machines that do this with much less effort, but this was the old and simple way to do it. Maybe you'd connect the, the, the pulley to a mule. So it's called come along. 
I can't tell whether I can read better for one eye or not. The hook links to whatever stable, plugged down, not to be budged like my grandfather after the Depression. There's a pulley, lines, ropes, wires useful for winching go around the pulley circle's block, and they confuse the awful weight of things that don't want to be moved. They shift tension. They understand a lie. They go behind the implacable. All you need then is the lever that ratchets through space, linking the unimaginable place and the home thing that holds a man's will sufficient to imagine everything changed and the faith there's no one bigger, stronger, or wielding a better machine against you. So another animal poem. I don't know how this got in here, but it's here. And, and this is a poem written about, and I want to read it really for Wyatt and for the, uh, the, the stray cat who showed up in, in his place. We've all, or many of us anyway, have had that happen. And this is uh, Ron Smith, the poet Ron Smith in Richmond, has such a cat. Um, and Ron was faced with the dilemma, which also comes to some of us, uh, that the cat that showed up on his door and to whom he is now devoted I is a super killer. Um, bird feathers everywhere. And Ron loves birds, uh, so this, this was a problem. What do you do? Um, the poem is inexplicably called Ron's Cat. Mice in my wall remind me of fur transformed, dead, that Ron once loved to stroke, anonymous on his bed, as he had been at the door that night of blowing rain, dried, fed, left to claim the fire. He needed no name. What he needed was a bell, Ron said, trees stuttering with robins, first twitter of finches, cardinal's ring of feathers on porch steps, Nothing Ron could change. Then there was the brass gleam, the body's fearful shake, claws digging blood from a black and white neck. He'll accept things, Ron said, after one or two weeks. Today, on my way to work, a dog leaped before a car, trailing a leash, brakes breaking the stair I'd fallen into, waiting to walk with all the other feet. I might have been wondering why or what I was doing to help a child I love flee a marriage brutal as traffic. Suddenly, that dog was free, blood, bone white, the sick look somewhere on the face of someone calling its name. I thought how wonderful would be a bell's faint pealing in that ear, then thought of Ron's vanished cat and wild Ron who took the bell off. And that was that. A little poem that has something to do with two other poems I want to read. This is just a description of, of something that here in the South we like, moonshine. I, I have no way of knowing if any of you have ever had moonshine. I think it tastes like kerosene. Um, but the effect is better than kerosene. <laughs> Just a little description. No water is clearer. The vibration of molecules so perfectly timed. Vision opens the eye upon the beloved leg canted in the sunshine, and breath goes in and stops for an instant, a rabbit swiveling look before it vaults into the air. And the next step, trembly as a spider's, knows the movement of everything on earth and takes it in and turns and wants much more. Uh, this is a poem that I've never read. I wrote it some months ago, and you will see in the end how it comes now to my contemporary circumstance. And it's weird, it seems to me, the way poems can do that. It tells a story, which I'll have to tell you beforehand so you or I feel I will, so you'll know what happens. I was about 22. I was a high school football coach, and a friend of mine, um, his father died. His father was what's known in Virginia as a waterman, meaning he, he 
usually by himself, but sometimes with another man, would work to catch crabs in crab pots, or he would fish fike nets, the little nets that run out from the shore. You'll see the stakes from the water. Uh, one way or another, he worked the water like a farmer works the land. And, uh, and he died. The old man was called Peterless. It was a family joke. He had 12 children. Um, very interesting man. When he died, Billy called me one morning, and he said, we have to take the old boat out and bury it. That was a kind of custom in that area. Um, so it meant we had to take the boat out around the point to what was called a hummock of land, just a kind of hump that was out of the way of any traffic. And the idea was he and his brother George would run the boat aground. They would knock a hole in her. She would sink in that place where the other old men's boats were buried. And tra tradition would be served. And I was to wait in the little dinghy off the way a little bit. And when they signaled me to come and pick them up and take them back to land. No one had told me that the dinghy until that week had been sunk and the motor was mostly rusted into not working. It worked enough to pull away um, and there I sat, all not knowing much what to do, while they hemmed and hawed and did whatever they did. It looked to me like they were knocking a hole in the boat, but I never did see it. I was too far off in the water. And then they waved me to come in. Well, my boat wouldn't go exactly. And then it would go too exactly. Um, and then, the, so the poem, I used to wear very thick Coke bottle glasses in those days. Um, and that's, that's how the poem got started. I was rummaging around looking for something and I have this box of old glasses and I, it was like, like a memory, like part of my life come back to me. So the poem is called Glasses. In the shoebox in my closet, mausoleum of frames, lenses, cases, a round gold pair, antiques, the templates light as ghosts. Wearing these, I saw George ferry in his dead father, heart attack, so Billy, the older brother, said burying the boat needed one more. I wore them the day we rode over the bar, George out of jail, my friend and me just 22, peeling dinghy towed behind, sun a gas fire. In the V-notch prow, I felt the salt crusting my face as we plowed and burst through swells over bottom white as bed sheets, islands of green sea plants waving in slow motion, a choreography of tides you can't see except by way, the way they move. I saw everything that swarmed and darted and burrowed there. Then we curled in a cove, its hummock cradling the buried hulls, canted as if in forgiveness, ours next to be sunk. It was supposed to be easy. We'd ram the slim 20-footer in the narrow squinch of shallow water between two already gutted. So far gone, no thieves would find a brass screw, no wheels, no painted name. I was supposed to putter behind, deliverer where a hole was chopped. The dinghy's once drowned stuck throttle eased like a latch. Ferryman to dark souls begot by the departed father, the soon-to-be-dead boat buoyed in and out 44 years. But when I pushed, it stuck. The water held me like mud suck. Gently, at first, they called to me. Then in hoarse commands, like those of Achilles, watching spirits of comrades fly off in specks of blood. And then George firing the old man's pistol more or less at me. <laughs> Ripping a knuckle, I snapped the peacock off. The bow lifting with a roar, the hull vaulting forward, rolled side to side as I leaned to see what stake loomed. The glasses spattered as if with brains and pieces of skin, and like trash I came finally settled all at once as if dropped from a deck, water sloshing and chafing the way a man's terror will do. Both brothers hopping in then, the dinghy beating its own wake. Son of a bitch if I ever forget you, George said. Billy glared. I wanted to wipe my glasses, but soaked, I went on blindly. Today, 
along the bar shore, a cold scatter of boats, gulls high, tacking in the sun's sway, cries so different and yet so alike, nothing looks up, gold-eyed for a source. The smell of gas mud makes decaying is all it takes to call back a waterman's odor of salt, bushels filled, stacked, held out to the byman, then the guzzle hot in throats, the soft talk of hours. Each fragment of driftwood seems bone bleached, enemies driven to the reed edge, hulled, broken, gouge and push of manhood's will, smooth to the touch as love's father stilled. They were supposed to hack out a hole, two in tandem, me to ferry, but they did not, unable to blink off what happens, that dream of the good. We wiped glasses, all morning drank whiskey, having puttered back to land. George died. That boat drifted. Billy, unsleeping, rocks in a chair, watching the bar, where all you see is like water in a paint can. For the youngest, cataract surgery, years ago. The smallest move of fin or claw available now. Gold frames in a drawer stashed. One lens, an eye thumbed out. The other, as if wet or dark, shining. That's where the moonshine came in. And this is called Memory of Peterless. When uh, we had a snow that winter in Virginia, it was a heavy snow and it was quite unusual on the, on the shore. And uh, old Peterless had, had broken his arm lifting a crab tap, trap out of the water, which in those days they still did by hand. Now they have winches, but they didn't. He didn't anyway. Um, and so he needed some help. He, he was an old man. And we were standing around uh, drinking and eating something, and the snow was falling, and he got worried. His boat needed to have the snow. He thought it would sink. It, it would mount up. And uh, so we all said, okay, we'll go. We'll help you. So we piled in the cars. It was like a road trip. We, we drove about 10 miles to the boat. And then he died. And there was a funeral. It was the first time I'd ever been to a wake. The funeral was in his wife's house. His wife was a woman named Homer. And people came that I'd never seen, and they, they would stand around the casket, open casket, and have a drink, and tell jokes. It was just a wonderful thing. This was in a very, very racist community. And yet, black people showed up. It came to the way. It was just extraordinary. This is called Memory of Peterless. The last time I saw him, George, the mostly jailed son, was out at the come-in dock, and his father was the bag of goods George passed up to the long hands. Heart attack, 12 children, one bed, one house, one job. Homer, the woman who fed them and sang, rocking, the room swelling with hurricane surge, shoes floating. Enough, Billy, the teacher said, it once lipped in her underwear. I should probably stop and tell you, there had been a hurricane, and they just stayed in their place, and the water had come in so deep that Miss Homer was rocking in her chair, and it came, Billy used to say, it came in her underwear. The old one shot him a look when he'd say that. A slug of bourbon sluiced in Mountain Dew made his face red, his dead, ri dead rise bow like a boat plunging. One arm hung that crab trap snapped when the swells came from nowhere. Now it was Christmas snow. She'll sink, he said. Water's water. It's the goddamn truth. Have a drink, Billy said. Quietly, I said, mister. At Liberty, we all pitched in. We drove three in front, three back. The old man gloved like gauntlets. Between two of us, so pale crabs nosing wouldn't sniff him. He didn't speak. He had a drink. On the boat, we made snow fly. Shovels, handfuls, the broom scything, him in the little cabin, room for a gnome, watching me pee over the gunnel. Later, he said, you college boy? Yes, I said, breath puffed as we rode. Each one, he asked, 
pondering his truth, his head cocked like a crane, stretched, tilted, each hummock of reed, rock, barnacle, hull, a shape he knew, just men and boys, Billy with words, George with ratchets, then the black suit, small in silk, the party noise, the hellos, the Jim Beam bottle on the box, the cheeks wind cindered, and now the jolly ones slide up, moor in the corner, big fists full, sipping, talking of wisdom in rooms stilled by the god of dusk. I seem to be caught in that period of time. If my wife were here, she would probably chastise me for reading you this poem that she's never heard. It's called Bourbon in a Cup. By Olin's boathouse, ivy hanging so it tickled my rear end, I lowered onto you, felt the night-wet grass beneath us, careless and happy. Hadn't we, the night before, climbed atop a boat's flying bridge, water rocking us in love like a heartbeat we couldn't stop. Afterward, moonlight on the water, so I leaped. Then you, into the foaming dark, no worry, at shell's edge or beer bottle or bottom's pall. What did we care The traffic rattled over Mercury Bridge? Behind us, the patios spilled voices, bantering and sexual, our long-married friends, flirting, pleasured, babies asleep or not born yet, steaks on cookers sizzled, beer ice blistered. Some sipped at cups, gold with cheap bourbon, the stars of cigarettes splashing near us, and still we went on, where the flood tide smell of marsh and mud covered us when I think about it. You hid under me, yellow summer dress rolled up on your belly, tiny bees in the fabric, rip of your fingernails stinging through my blue, my blue shirt. Mosquitoes grazed us, loosing blood. I remembered colognes mixing, the useless snapper lights, that raw mowed over onion grass of the lawn. You giggled and came. Reeds shifted as water pushed the dawn and James Brown toward us. If we die soon, I said, and have to explain how good we were in life, we won't mention this. We'll speak of the tires on Olin's crushed oyster drive, voices calling us to leap over where they had tested the depth, splashing and climbing, trying it again. And if asked why we didn't stop, remembering those diving in love to show us how to rise in the blackness out of the weeds into the ivy and bourbon in our cup. We weren't quite married then, but have been now married for 44 years. <laughs> and in one of those years, we were looking at a house. I have to tell you about this if you want to understand the poem. We, we'd moved somewhere, and the realtor was taking us to show us a house. And we went in, and in the front parlor, there, there was, a, a, I guess, a day bed, but a bed open. And these two people, elderly people, rose up out of the bed, and the, and the man said, ah! <laughs> and I think he was trying to say, who are you? <laughs> well, we wondered who they were, and, and we quickly retreated. I have come to the age where I'm thinking a lot about older people. This is a poem called Fireflies. You see them everywhere and hardly notice the one cranking past as you pass on the sidewalk, that mewling watery eye partly bloodshot, partly focused on you or some apprehension of you, a shrunken one in the giant self-checkout line, ankles like just risen pigs in dried mud. And now the puzzled, warty face turns to you and you are helpless, stunned. The routine glowing signals are suddenly hieroglyphics you're punching out someone's last life savings. You want to scream. Better, it seems, to walk faster, 
left on Main Street. Take the boiling sun on your back, still broad enough to hold whatever comes next today. That's the trick of it, knowing you can, without thinking, navigate, slide, cut quick, the way kids on front yards do in the smell of mowed grass and sweat, not dusk yet, any tumbling brush of bone and skin, a sweet proof of intent, intersection and angle, the right desire of things subtle as what the fireflies mean. Once, my wife and I, following the girlish realtor, opened a parlor door, brownstone, dim, cool, two bodies in pajamas pushing up in a musky bed, no one supposed to be there, husband and wife, I've thought all these years. The call, throats made, horrific as ungreased gears, pistoned by us already healing out. Did someone later come, explain who we were, snafus, unlock door, our children? Or did they lie, walls creaking until dawn, words like bugs in their mouth, sucked, waiting? No one that I know of had ever written a poem about Jiffy Lube, so I thought that'd be a good subject. I have a car, so I get my oil changed. And when you're in Jiffy Lube, you have to sit there and wait. You have to read whatever everybody before you has been reading. And of course, it's soiled and, well, you know. This is a poem called Dissection. I found an essay in the reading room of Jiffy Lube a memoir, a medical student walking us through the steps. It meant discovery as old oil was getting flushed. Pages, readers soiled and tore like personal history. The gaps required a leaping mind, maybe the kind that body had, I thought. No news of what sex started things, its failed poetry, if different parts decoded fear or pride or football's broken shoulder and chronic ankles, not even the rheumatoid arthritis that bends a lady's fingers like those hooked ones resting quiet beside me. I thought how I loved a woman's long, slender fingers and remembered the blunt, fat stubs my daddy wrapped around screwdrivers. Go get me one, he'd scream, whatever it was one of. And I wouldn't see which screw, bolt, washer meant something. So I tried to keep the hole in mind, if there was one, and looked in the usual drawers like he told me to, pushing aside this or that wrapper laid over spark wires, plugs, torn envelopes, and dug into stashed car mags, rods rehabbed, welding tips, tech talk, chrome's lingo, paint layered like desire, then way deeper than imagined, still hoping only to find what I was sent to bear back, I saw the hand. The body coiled, naked, sun running on it like gasoline. I could feel her suddenness like match or spark. Stunned, I stayed too long. The long scream, the least of what I would remember and keep still like prose. I work at one of those schools where every now and then they send you out to be a recruiter for donor funds. Last year I was sent to go duck hunting on the eastern shore with a man who had some money the school wanted. Um, his name is Porter Hopkins. Nice man, uh, not, nothing about that. So we got there to his geese blind and uh, this is a poem about that. And it may evoke for some of you um, a, a story by a French writer uh, about geese flying overhead. And you, you might want to know the simple fact about geese is that they mate for life, <laughs> which seems like what I did. <laughs> Goose blind, wild reeds woven to a small room, dying tips, brown gold, and whispering in wind rattle. Porter whose farm is bare, its fields married to water, honks as if the earth is talking. 
his old gun hugged to him, his bone nose up for two dipping flybys. They veer, but don't come down. They glide around. Mated pair, he says softly. I think of us 40 years ago, side by side, driving south on 17, the dismal swamps, bogs, all green lace, because March is done. April's warm inlet calls us because we lay on the sand, the car radio booming James Brown, that joyful news. At the Nags Head Bridge, we turn back, just married, tiny boats half sunk in marsh. Shivering now, wondering why I am here, a guest among floaters of Bub Bottom's empty shells that once were oysters, each wet black eye that knows only rising, falling with the sun's time, unafraid like you, saying, let's go so far the years will drift, up roads like still bays, to roofs, to wood lines where the horizon is new. Round and round the two fly, wanting now to eat, afternoon graying, wanting to lie with the field's others, wanting homes mixed, swaying silhouettes. On the sky's stair steps, like guests, the pairs slip from V-lines, no reason. They just can't go on, Porter says, honking urgent cries they seem not to want to hear. I remember what I wanted to read. I'll read a little poem about playing tennis. Or it seems to be about that. It's called Making a Statement. Uh, I used to play tennis with some graduate students. And, uh, and I was significantly older than they were. And I liked the idea, this is in Louisiana, where all the lawyers have ponytails. And I wanted one too. But as you can see, I was having some difficulty. Uh, and that comes into the poem. This was a time when my hair was a little longer than it should have been. But it wasn't long enough that it should have been. So it's called making a statement. Thousands lately have asked me about my hair. Why is it so long? Why haven't you cut it? I think about Samson, of course, and his woe. His hair like thickets where I was born, swamps, tall grasses bending with red-winged blackbirds, like a woman's nipples in the quick sun gold. I could tell about Samson, about the girl, but I just say my head is cold. I need cover. Playing tennis with a leggy blonde I love, I admit I can't do anything with it. My youth, she rolls her eyes into a smashing serve. You old guys. She teases with her hot drop shot. Back and forth all day, yellow balls, long gray hair. <laughs> you might want to think about it. <laughs> Some years ago, I took my beautiful two daughters and my wife to Italy. I wasn't prepared to take three beautiful blonde women to Italy. It, it caused a sensation everywhere we seemed to go. And I, I was very protective, which did no good at all, considering my blonde daughters didn't want my protection. I'm not sure about my wife. <laughs> there we were in the piazzas, uh, which I persisted on in calling the squares, and this is one of those times called uh, Boys in the Square at Bologna. You know, there are always those boys in those squares hanging around. <laughs> and there are always those statues with <laughs> things peeing. <laughs> Across the courtyard of gold fountains at dusk, they strut, water lifting like smoke from penises of stone. One of my students said, you should call your book Penises of Stone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I said, no, there's probably a good reason not to do that. You know, <laughs> I'll start over. <laughs> Across the courtyard of gold fountains at dusk they strut, water lifting like smoke from penises of stone. The dark earth cools as each one preens in the square's mouth, indolence, masks, beringed fingers, pigeons cooing for secrets of the centuries ooze like spilled milk. When our girls come on silky heel clicks, three whistle up the air's exotic cries. They bob like fish, white for the moon, and leap. Some disrobe, their chests pale as panties, big neck chains, amulets dancing, Marlboros, scooters, raz. The loudest spout louder what fucking they will do tonight, their hands miming the untouched and ripe. You can see why I was being protective, <laughs> or at least felt protective. Uh, I think there was one in here I wanted to read. A little one. Some of you may not know that Mr. Alan Tate is buried in the cemetery across the way here. Mr. Peter Taylor was buried there, but Mrs. Taylor decided he would be better in Charlottesville, and so she moved him. But Mr. Mr. Tate is still there. Um, and I, I like to read this when I'm at Sewanee because there's, we all have such a f wonderful feeling about this place. So it's called At Alan Tate's Grave. Tate lies in the dark green ground where sun shines enough to sift Holly's thick, inflexible limbs. They claw a man who pushes round to come morning, one not quick to see what looms, whips, or hangs in summer's raking heat. Winters, leaf naked, it's easier to review what nature thinks, avoid stings, step over sleeping copperheads, move unburdened by sore cause on tongue. Cardinal summer here, they boom their grave speech at meadowlark, finch, wren, fearless of anyone almost, blood spots from the heart of the sky that daily sinks to dark. The mystery is what loves a man. Writers come here. They look, leave. A cheerful gray squirrel barks. The stream mumbles as if it grieves. Every spring, turns predictable. The botany class studies dogwood. Musicians play airs, half-reached tunes. Some hearts, yours, stir with zeal. Noon broods, then it's afternoon. Well, now's the real risk. I want to read a poem that I was revising this morning. It's always dangerous, and, uh, and yet I want to see how it'll go. And I want to read this for all of our dear pal, Dick Bausch. He and I were enlisted men in the Air Force at the same time, and uh, we have lots of stories about those bad old days. Well, I was lucky during Vietnam I didn't go, it was close, but didn't go. But my job in the, in the Air Force sometimes required me to teach composition to people who were coming back from Vietnam, about to get discharged, and as we used to say, go back into the world. That phrase comes up in the poem. And I have never forgotten one of those composition papers. For years, I've been trying to write this poem. I'm sure you'll let me know whether I got it done or not. But this is for you, pal, because you'll remember it. The poem is called 17 Parts of a Duck. And you'll see why. To avoid the Army, I enlisted Air Force, stayed stateside, taught freshman comp nights, days typed death benefits for blank faces, then got out. Burned uniforms, forgot it all, except the last class, old men like me now, then getting ready for whatever life is in the world. I said, men, do a definition essay. The first papers came, words naked as those in sickbay where we met 
Base Hospital 3B, and I still see one older medic who made me double up with laughter at his thesis. A duck with 17 parts will live and function honorably as a duck. My height and weight, shy as a snake, two tours in Vietnam. He hinted things he couldn't say, except in supply lists of parts, upper scapula, lower scapula, leg, beak, eye, tongue, foot, asshole, technically not a part, I redlined. Knee, spine, rib, liver, gut, guts, I queried, and heart. So what, I scrawled at bottom line, pushing him past bare facts to claim some greater thing. He did. Bible says girl ducks got no rib. Assholes is what gets blown up first. Scapulas hold wings. No logic made me howl like his. He revised. Parts were cut by ad hoc hacks or stapled in the way he'd cupped and healed those sent home alive. A brain, a web of skin, tiny dicks, nothing to signal fear, pain, scheme, or purpose. Why? Why? I wrote, thinking now he'd put me on, gasping at his catechism. If each of 17 parts is present and in working order, he said, the unit will function as a duck. <laughs> on the sixth day, he read his paper in the white antiseptic space, eyes flickering like a man in a hole, old parts gone, new parts totaling 17. Same thesis, a dawn blunt as flame-thrown gas where we gaped and led us to his new conclusion. If we the people would treat each duck equal, America, ducks can live and grow to be ducks. Flat as a body bag, his voice spread before us. Reading on past the end, he discovered, as if no way in the world could stop the words forming up to fight for all he knew. A good duck stands on its own feet. Bad ducks are spineless. Ducklings eat shit. My note said, He's one composition short. Where's the meaning? I still see his medals like a billboard, a poster child belief he'd get all right, he'd make all right, who'd sawed at boys the way I'd tear a pizza. What if I couldn't pound one idea into such a hairless head, tilted and listening as if to an engine knock? I wrote, what's your purpose? Then an evening came, hot, snickery laughs, not mine, his, who said words are just the shit we make you memorize to get home safe, and waddled out of class, where the rest of us grinned and went on passing. Now I wonder where he went on our seventh day, who claimed to know enough to save the dying, but not to tell us what a duck might mean. And if I failed him, and if I hear the rest laughing as we call out his thesis like a mission code, what more is there than a joke, a war, senseless as a duck he couldn't make right? And why, at last, do I still dream of 17 parts undefined?